good evening everyone good evening yeah uh, so a very warm welcome to all the vets for joining this webinar from different parts of the globe we have participants from all parts of the world so this webinar is presented by natural remedies private limited i dr prakash kangal uh, techno commercial manager at pet natural remedies will be moderating today's session of this webinar to make this webinar interactive there are options for chat questions and poll on your screen if you are using a desktop or laptop you can see this option on the right side of your screen or if you are using a mobile then you can see this option by clicking the right arrow like arrow on the right corner of your screen so that you can see the polls uh, like chat and questions options if you want to introduce yourself you can give your suggestions then use chat options if you want to ask any questions then please use the question sections on your screen you can ask your questions any time during the webinar and we'll be very happy to answer all the questions in the end of the session after all these instructions uh, i would like to request mr ayush agarwal a business head of pet natural remedies to introduce our natural remedies to all the participants over to you ayush good evening everyone it is an honor and immense pleasure for us to host this webinar with a great speaker and for giving us this platform to launch a new product virtually as an organization our core values and beliefs is to be useful to the society and we at pet nature remedies in association with ppak bangalore is organizing part 6 of the webinar series and a virtual launch of a new product useful in a day to day clinics practices natural remedies is one of the leading animal and human herbal health companies presently our products include medicinal and supplements in cattle poultry sheep and aquatic life we are now stepping <clears throat> into a future of first of its kind pet and pet parent friendly range of products for the companion animals we solely believe in harnessing nature and applying science to health and happiness for more details please log on to our website petnatureremedies.com thank you thank you uh, mr ayush uh, now i would request request dr nagesh reddy sir uh, secretary of pet practitioner association of karnataka to please share few words about ppk association over to you sir good evening everyone so i like to welcome all the members of ppak delegates from all over india and our outside india also to this webinar so ppak is conducting the webinars from the lockdown period from last one year and uh, we have conducted around 10 to 12 out of which we are associated with the natural remedies this is the sixth uh, one we are doing with natural remedies i thank ayush and natural remedies team especially partnering with us to conduct such webinars from last one year thank you natural remedies now thank i you. ask uh, dr parmeshwar to take over please please sir sir you need to uh, unmute sir so unmute uh, the yes sir yeah. yes sir good evening sir respected uh, president secretary ppak and other all office bearers and uh, navin sir aish agrawal sir uh, and uh, prakash and today's eminent speaker dr joseph cyrus i am so happy for providing me an opportunity to introduce dr joseph cyrus who is a very young uh, practitioner in canada and uh, should be an inspiration to all of us for uh, sharing his knowledge both theoretically as well as his practical approaches i am so happy to introduce dr joseph cyrus because he is uh, from our country from kerala he completed his uh, graduation from thrissur veterinary college manuthi in 2007 and also he did his post graduation from bangalore itself in uh, medicine after completing his post graduation he has joined uh, for his uh, doctorate in texas university in 2018 he has completed uh, his uh, doctorate in uh, internal medicine and uh, the specific subject being uh, gastroenterology so we are presently he is working with veterinary care associates 
across many countries in the globe and uh, he is working in uh, Alta Vista Hospital in Ottawa in Canada. So I welcome him. We are all so happy to have him here for today's speak because nowadays the internal medicine, especially gastroenterology, uh, the today's topic approaches for uh, diagnosis treatment of uh, gastroenteric problems in pets is becoming both in dogs and uh, cats is becoming more and more significant because myself has experienced few cases of viral gastroenteritis despite of vaccination with a good vaccine as well as many times tick barn infections viral gastroenteritis and parasitic uh, gastroenteritis all these things are becoming a challenging uh, topic in the clinical practice yes. because where the differential diagnosis is really becoming tough and tough many many times uh, it's uh, a mixed infection or sometimes vague clinical signs uh, misguiding the practitioner yes. that Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I think the topic uh, chosen today would be more precise and more useful for our practitioners and uh, yes. maybe after uh, the dermatology cases, I think uh, gastroenterology would be the, uh, yes. the next uh, highest uh, cases what we see and uh, treatment also becomes quite challenging. It will not end up with one day or two days treatment with single shot of some uh, kind of antibiotic or antiprotozoal injections or something like that. It will take two to three days, sometimes, you know, a week time uh, with continuous uh, systemic uh, fluid therapies, supportive treatments. And uh, one more thing is uh, the gastroenterology cases do not not only bothers the, cl the clinician or practitioner or veterinarian, but also the owner because so many times the dog would puke, he throws up and many times uh, foul smelling diarrhea at home. It's really bothering too much like that. Uh, this topic, today's discussion or whatever Dr. So Joseph Cyrus is going to share with us is going yes. to be more and more useful. And I'm really in this way, very, very thankful to Natural Remedies, who is, uh, which is coming up with uh, wonderful uh, uh, products nowadays, more useful in the clinic. Navin sir, Ayush Agrawal sir, uh, and all our uh, president, secretary, office bearers and uh, speaker, I am really thankful to you. Thank you so much. Over to the speaker. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So I will request uh, Dr. Cyrus uh, now to please uh, start. Uh, Over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. So can you share the screen, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is this good, guys? Can you see me? Yes, sir. Perfect. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much again. Uh, thank you all for having me. It, it is a pleasure actually to come back and speak to my fellow colleagues from Karnataka. It's been a while, but um, uh, it, it's very nice to be back again. Uh, uh, so basically, you're going to speak about diarrhea. And ever since um, what got me into diarrhea basically was my master's project at uh, Bangalore Veterinary College, where I looked at gastroenterology uh, to start with. And that's how I got uh, in tune with the gastrointestinal system. So just a quick disclosure that there is our honorarium from Natural Remedies for this presentation. Right? And so diarrhea is, you know, every yeah. single practitioner, every single human being on the surface of the earth has had diarrhea at some point in their life. It is something that we personally experience. We've seen it in our pet patients and in our pets at home. right? Uh, looking on the human side, uh, diarrhea is one of the leading most causes of diarrhea and uh, death in children. And about 2.2 million people uh, have diarrhea because of contaminated food across the world. So again, on the human side, still a huge problem. Uh, so we kind of talk about, you know, somebody mentioned that, you know, uh, dermatology, after dermatology, gastroenterology becomes the next major issue in small animal medicine. And unfortunately, it's, uh, you know, diarrhea is so common, but still there's very little data that is proven to know what's going on. How do we deal with diarrhea, even in um, a global scenario, especially chronic diarrhea? 
Great. So we all know this. We have all heard the definition of diarrhea. It's increased in the frequency, the fluidity, or the volume of feces. Uh, we've all seen it. It's very uh, standard, right? Uh, one thing that we always uh, question is, you know, is this an acute problem or is this a more chronic problem? Acute meaning being less than 14 days, chronic being about more than 14 days. We've all studied that the pathophysiology behind diarrhea, the osmotic form where there's uh, undigested uh, contents that suck in water, the secretory forms from the pathogens, usually the where there's increased production of, of fluid within the gut, the increased probability leading to uh, movement of um, uh, pathogens across the gut membrane and deranged mobility, so excessive uh, uh, propulsion of um, the gut. One thing that is very important for me as a practitioner is trying to figure out where the problem starts and, you know, is it a small bowel problem, is it a large bowel problem, or is it a mixed problem? And it becomes very important to classify that. Uh, when we look at small bowel, um, the telltale signs are there's usually vomiting. It's not always a cause, but usually there is some form of vomiting. There is some weight loss uh, in the blood. There's usually evidence of low albumin, low cholesterol, there's usually presence of fat in the blood, uh, stool, as well as uh, blood, digested blood or melina. In large bowel, uh, we have an increased urgency. So there's increased frequency, there's increased fecal volume, mucus, blood in the stools, an urgency uh, and straining, and also painful defecation. The problem arises when it's mixed bowel, where you can have both small, small bowel signs and large bowel signs, and which makes things more difficult. Right. Um, so just to uh, see where we are at, just sort of thought I would put a little case down, right? So this is uh, fecal sample pictures from a young dog. She's about seven months old. She's a Labrador, and she has liquid foul-smelling diarrhea that started about three months ago. So it is chronic, right? She goes to defecate about three to thirty three to fifty five times a day. There's small amounts of mucus and blood. Uh, she is seven months old and only weighs thirteen kilograms. She is small in her size. Um, and her uh, blood work is unremarkable except for an alkaline phosphatase and phosphorus, which is elevated because of her growth. Um, if you guys could just go to your poll and tell me what you guys think. Is this a small bowel diarrhea? Is this large bowel diarrhea or is this mixed? So uh, we have just shared a poll requesting all the participants to please uh, answer the polls. We have one minute for that. So next to that, Dr. Cyrus will give his insights on that. Yeah. So, so from mobile, if anybody is accessing, we have option at the right side corner at the top of the right corner. You can see the poll options available. You can answer the polls immediately. So we are getting good responses. <laughs> In fact, getting answer for all the options. So, uh, doctor, you can see the poll results. I cannot actually. <laughs> uh, on the right hand side, uh, you can just click on the poll section. Okay, I. Oh, yes, I do see it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, so 26%, uh, tw about a quarter of y'all small bowel, large percentage large bowel, small percentage of y'all mixed diarrhea. I agree. And I think it is large bowel diarrhea. Uh, so you guys are on the right track. There is one more. So we're going to go to the next one very quickly. So can you just show the slide? So like yeah. One. So, all right, this is the second one. Again, uh, you don't have a history, but this is what the stools look like. Um, is this large bowel, small bowel, or mixed? So please uh, answer the second uh, question of the poll. Like we'd like to discuss on that further. So. Yes. 
it's good to interact with uh, the virtually and like understand like how the participants are interested in the topic and like it's really fast people are starting like responding to the questions great all right yeah it's still happening i guess yeah sir right. so uh Small bowel, about 37%. Large bowel, 26%. Mixed, about 37%. All right, we'll go back to the screen very quickly. Yeah. So the small bowel diarrhea and mixed uh, diarrhea are like equal numbers of uh, the answers we have received. Thank you, all participants. So we'll continue with the PPT. And Dr. Yeah, yeah. So we're just going back to this one again. You know, uh, you guys all, most of you all were on the dot. It is large bowel, and you know, the few things that are a bit slightly confusing in this is, you know, the animal is small in size, right? Um, and that could kind of go along with uh, mixed bowel diarrhea. But for the most part, the straining, the number of times the animal goes, the presence of blood, mucus is again all telltale signs of large bowel diarrhea. Coming to this one. This is a bit tricky, but uh, when we look at, um, uh, you know, without any history, I guess you could go both between small bowel and mixed, but this is very typical when you see large amount of undigested, shiny, mallow, this is very probably very foul smelling odor. It's probably more small bowel than mixed, but definitely um, without a history that would be difficult, but uh, this is classical what you would see with malabsorptive or true small bowel diarrhea as well. Moving on. So one thing um, that has gained a lot of interest in uh, uh, small gastroenterology as well as internal medicine for the most part is the gut microbiome, right? And when we talk about microbiome, it includes bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa. We know that there are about 100 trillion microbial cells in the gut. Uh, we know that as you move down from the mouth, the stomach into the colon, the number of bacteria increases. And then um, there's a lot of studies that have looked into the healthy bacteria of cats and dogs and they've seen that certain bacterial groups that we've never studied in our vet school but firmicutes bacteroides actinobacteria and fusobacteria are common inhabitants of the healthy gastrointestinal tract unfortunately our understanding of the gut microbiome on the veterinary side as well as the human side is very incomplete we are unsure if these bugs are good or bad and we see a lot of changes in these environments uh, with the animals that are born, born and brought up in, as well as in the, the use of antibiotics. And the, the role, especially of bacteria in uh, the gut is very, very uh, poorly understood, but we do know for sure that, you know, the presence of microbes are very important for the development of the gastrointestinal tract, the development of the immune system these back these commensal bacteria or these resident bacteria are responsible for uh, helping us from pathogens developing an intestinal barrier and um, of course the most important focus right now being the beneficial metabolites basically bile acids short chain fatty acids and um, products like indole and uh, you know back in the day we used to call we used to have a term called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and you know whenever we, we talked about diseases like epi or exocrine pancreatic insufficiency we used to call that there was bacterial overload in the intestine and over the years we have actually shown that this condition really doesn't exist in dogs and cats as we expect it to it does exist in human beings but we almost for the, for the most part we have something called dysbiosis dysbiosis means that we just we normally have you know, uh, back, oh, sorry, we normally have, um, as you can see in the picture, you know, a good population of healthy bacteria, the diphtobacteria or the lactobacilli. And something happens with your system that there is a shift in the bacterial population. So what we call the good and the bad bacteria. So the, prop the proportions of ba good and ba bad bacteria change. And then you have a mixture of bacteria that doesn't, that's not supposed to be there. And this is what is known as dysbiosis, right? And we've shown that over the years that every single disease, whether it's acute or chronic gastrointestinal disease, does have a shift in these the gastric microbiome or there is a dysbiosis associated with it. Very recently, for the past three or four years, 
some of the uh, researchers have come up with, with a, uh, an index known as um, a fecal dysbiosis index. So basically, you take the feces and you send it to a lab, and they tell you they look at the amount of bacteria that are present doing by doing a, a PCR test, right? And they also tell you uh, eight different groups that are present, right? And they give you a fraction of what bacteria uh, is is there in what numbers. Specifically, bacterial populations like the Clostridium hirudonis, the Fusobacterium, and the Blaustia. And they come up with a little number called the dysbiosis index. So if you are a healthy dog, you should have a negative dysbiosis index. That means you have a decent amount of bacterial population. If you, this, there's a shift in your bacteria, then you get a positive dysbiosis index. Right? They did see that, you know, a value greater than zero in this test you in dogs with chronic uh, GI disease, uh, they were able to be sure by the sensitivity of 74% and the specificity of 95%, right? It basically tells you something is right, something is not right, but it doesn't tell you um, what's causing it or how do you go about treating it, right? And so this is an index that's coming up uh, very commonly in a lot of um, studies. Again, this is completely made up based on the long-term data. So we can, we're going to switch groups very quickly to um, acute diarrhea, right? So we have an, um, per acute diarrhea, so it's happened in the last 24 to 48 hours, where we know the animal got into something or, and you know, like table food or different food, and the animal is not dehydrated, it's eating well, running around, like we're popping the picture. Normally in these cases, I don't do anything. I just have them hang out and uh, see things will resolve on their own. But if usually if clinical signs go about 72 hours, that's the point where we say, you know, we need to consider something. If the diarrhea is acute where the animal is not feeling well, it's not eating, it's otherwise sick, that raises a concern that, you know, there's something more going on and then we do need to get on treatment, basically because the animal is going to get dehydrated. We need to restore electrolyte balance. Your classical example being things like parvo, right? Um, then we, the introduction of diets, um, antiparasitics, so uh, heavy worm burdens, uh, sometimes antibiotics, and then also consider the possibility of um, systemic or infectious diseases like you all talked about uh, tick-borne disease as an example. The, unfortunately, the amount of uh, things that can cause acute diarrhea in dogs and cats is endless, right? So we have animals that uh, eat random stuff, toxins, diet changes, uh, plants, drugs, anything can cause a diarrhea, right? Uh, again, most of them are self-limiting unless they are a toxin, which requires intervention. We have a variety of bacterial species that can cause acute diarrhea in dogs and cats. Again, uh, some of them, the presence of the bacteria does not tell you it's the cause of the diarrhea, but if there's a single population that is predominantly present or you have a response to treatment, that's where things come into play. Protozoa, uh, uh, our parasites, uh, hook uh, helminths, again, are very, very common. But again, they are, for the most part, you know, seen in younger animals, seen in animals that are having issues, uh, you know, they don't bounce back they, because of some background disease. Viral diseases, everybody, I'm sure, in Bangalore is familiar with parvo, distemper, uh, panleukopenia in cats. Uh, so. This is a very, very common disease that we see. Uh, again, acute diarrhea where intervention is uh, important. Right? Uh, less likely in Bangalore, but very common in southern parts of Texas, uh, in, in Ottawa, where we see fungal diseases, uh, histoplasma, pythium, basidia bolus. And of course, there are these syndromes that we poorly understand, being um, acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome, or previously known as um, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis in dogs. Um, Cushing, um, Addison's disease, and then also um, ob obstructions from foreign bodies or interception, and then very more recently something called bile acid diarrhea. So acute diarrhea is basically, uh, you know, there is really no treatment for it except for you know manage the after you manage hydration, we look at a few substances called adsorptions, probiotics, prebiotics. We rarely use motility modifiers. And some other products that are hitting the market, like um, slippery elm. Unfortunately, in veterinary medicine, even to date, there's really no data in the use of oral protectants uh, for um, acute diarrhea. Uh, it is basically these substances like calon pectate, bismuth, 
activated charcoal or barium that is used to help coat the gut basically helps to uh, absorb bacteria toxins uh, prevent the coating of the inflamed gut uh, sometimes bismuth is actually preferred in the western countries in dogs because um, uh, in cats you have to be a bit more careful because of the salicylates associated with it We've all heard about prebiotics, probiotics, postbiotics, symbiotics. The otics world is huge, right? And just uh, for better classical clarification, that probiotics are actually live um, organisms that are given uh, as part of supplement, food, or drugs that we know has a proven benefit to the host. Prebiotics are basically fiber, fibers or carbohydrates that can help bacteria to grow. The postbiotics is something I learned very recently. It's basically uh, non-viable bacteria that have a beneficial um, effect on the host. And there's a lot of interest in this area that's coming up in veterinary medicine. In symbiotics, again, pre and probiotics combined together. Even though there's a, a lot of products in the market, we rarely do not know, have enough data on the use of these products, right? What do we what we do know is that in some cases of uncomplicated diarrhea, for example, a dog going to the kennel or a dog getting uh, picked up from the shelter, they do have a diarrhea that doesn't respond to probiotics. But we do see that if they put on probiotics before all this happens, their diarrhea interval is shortened by one to three days. There's a one percent less chance of diarrhea, and then if they're fed uh, on this, um, given this uh, probiotic for long periods of time for one to three weeks then we can see some better in the fecal consistency. We do know that in puppies with parvo viral gastroenteritis using lactobacillus cultures, they've shown that the mortality rate um, uh, decreases and there's an improvement in the white cell count. Again, with um, diseases like the hemorrhagic gastroenteritis or the acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome, uh, probiotics with lactobacillus have shown to show improved uh, changes to the gut bacteria and also reduce uh, clostridium perfringens, which believes which may play a part in the disease process. Um, in parasitic diseases, uh, we, there's actually no benefit of using pro pro uh, probiotics. In cats with disease like Phytrichomonas, uh, probiotics have shown to prevent relapses. In animals taking antibiotics, for example, in cats with uh, amoxicillin or uh, clindamycin, probiotics have really no benefit. In dogs with lincomycin, they've shown that there is some improvement in the diarrhea. Uh, moving on to prebiotics, you know, it's again a whole list of, a list of, our, uh, of substances that can be used, cellulose, lignin, pectin, psyllium, guar, and the fructose oligosaccharides. Again, most of these have a, a binding effect or a bulking effect on fecal volume, promoting intestinal motility, production of short chain fatty acids, and uh, changing uh, production of acetates and increases in the um, uh, bifidobacterial group of organisms. We, these do have a place in the management of more chronic diarrhea than acute. This is a can of worms, and we all have a tendency to use antibiotics because it is frustrating when animals get diarrhea and not to use antibiotics. Unfortunately, the current recommendation is to avoid antibiotics as much as possible because uh, it leads to uh, complications uh, and only used if there is evidence of sepsis. So sick animal, fever, not eating, increase, decreased white cell counts. Uh, they've also, some studies have shown that you know, using antibiotics like metronidazole actually improved the period where the diarrhea goes off quicker in three days versus five days if you didn't use antibiotics. Uh, a small last topic that I would touch on, there's a whole lot of interest in fecal microbial transplants. We've done this in cows, we've done this in goats, we've done this in sheep over periods of time. We call it cud transplantation, where we take fluid from the rumen and give it orally to cats, cows that have not been, have a disturbed microbial system. But this is becoming a point of therapy in dogs and cats we've using extensively uh, in animals that have um, uh, acute diarrhea. For example, we choose a dog that is healthy, that has no GI issues in the past 90 days. They are born not naturally, not by C-section, uh, and they maintain ideally on the same diet, or it, they should also not be fat. And uh, the recipient is usually off antibiotics or supplements for a week. We take a poop, we make a, uh, a slurry by diluting it in tap water, 
it's blended, we move the chunks and we fill it up and we give it about five to 10 mil per kilo body weight uh, using an enema, leaving the animal to not move around for about two to three hours. It's a messy procedure, but there is enough data, especially in things like Parvo, where they've seen that the the mortality rate is diffused, as well as um, uh, the the improvement of clinical science is a lot better. Uh, this is a quick um, uh, look at you know fecal microbial transplants and how it helps with dysbiosis. So basically, uh, one of the roles of bacteria, especially the Clostridium hirudonis, is basically converting your primary bile acids to your secondary bile acids. And you can see on the screen that, you know, there's a dysbiosis index on the left. There are dates at the bottom, right? And um, before the uh, fecal microbial transplant that happened, you can see that the animal had a dysbio dysbiosis. And as soon as the, um, the, the, uh, uh, the fecal transplantation happened, the dysbiosis shifted very quickly to a normal flora, right? And we achieved some changes in with using uh, antibiotics like tylosin or metronidazole, but they actually lead to long-term changes in the gut index. With that, I will stop my first part, and then I'll have uh, them go over. Yeah. <clears throat> So uh, thank you, doctor. Uh, like uh, we'll have a small uh, presentation of a product uh, like we are uh, like uh, recently launched in the market. So like uh, before like uh, going for the technical presentation, I'd like to share a small video of the product. They will not stop no matter what. A simple change in weather, diet or water can trigger severe no discomfort what. in their tummies, leading weather, to digestive diet, problems. Can trigger Medicines or supplements to treat digestive problems in cats and dogs provide only a temporary relief. But what about the symptoms that will resurface? Most medicines contain chemicals and clay, resulting in harmful consequences on a long run. These are not recommended to maintain the gut health of your pets and are certainly not recommended for pups and kittens below the age of 3 months. Backed with years of research, Natural Remedies have developed NatGut, a wholesome natural supplement to improve gut health. Now, be it a pup, dog or a cat of any breed, NatGut helps in providing instant relief from digestive problems, ensures a good digestive health, prevents further relapses and brings an overall improvement in your pet's gut. NatGut comprises of all natural and safe ingredients such as kurchi, pomegranate, nut grass, prebiotics and natural soluble fiber making it safe for puppies and kittens as well. NatGut helps in treatment of diarrhea by aiding in stool bulking, controlling hypersecretion in intestine and selective increase of good bacteria. NatGut helps in the management of gut health by aiding enterocyte nutrition and improving digestive function. NatGut will effectively treat dietary and indigestion problems, diarrhea and gastroenteritis. It also reduces the bad odor in stool and restores microbial flora in your pets. It comes in palatable tablet form which can be broken easily that makes feeding an easy process. Why resort to mere temporary solutions when you have NatGut? Give it a try and witness your pet's gut health improve like never before. So uh, I take this opportunity to uh, show a small presentation of uh, the product which we have recently launched in the market. So I like to brief like uh, the basic technical things about the products uh, and like the clinical trial uh, what we have done for this. So uh, I like to uh, take this opportunity to reveal one of the product we have recently launched in the market called as NADGUT, which is a supplement to improve the digestive health. But before like uh, like giving any insights about what product uh, like ingredients and the mode of action we have, I like to reveal like every product what we have in natural medicine is basically based on evidence based medicine. So like we, we believe like unless until we have good number of evidence to show the product is really good and like going to help uh, the like health of the animal, 
we don't believe it's uh, like good to launch in the market so based on that concept like uh, every entire range we have is basically meant with the need of the hour like the veterinarians need like what the pet parent need and considering all the gaps we come up with a strategy what we can do best in that segment so with that i will just like to reveal like the new product what we have is called as nightgut so this nightgut is a natural uh, supplement which we help to improve the gut and digestive health so i will give in short introduction about what exactly it is so this product has five ingredients basically has three ingredients which are herbs like uh, oreria antidysentrica punica gratum like the cyphers odontatus like prebiotics like phos and natural soluble fiber so the entire ingredients what we have has a like multimodal action like of the all the phytoactives which are in like the most purest form without any side effects so this helps in like stool bulking like they helps in control hypersecretion in the intestine we help to regulate the bowel motility that will help to have a selective increase in the good bacteria also like this fibers and like uh, and like the prebiotics helps in the production of short chain fatty acids like what dr cyrus uh, said initially and like the herbs we have a very good research to show it inhibits the translocation of enteral pathogens and the toxins which like systematically and like it has a good antibacterial activity localized plus the prebiotics what we have helps in increasing the viability of the nutrients so this is just a brief about what we have in this uh, product as an ingredients we have done clinical trial also for to validate whatever claims we have made from the herbs so there is a small uh, slide you can see of clinical trials where the dog was given a treatment for 3 days and followed for like the next 3 uh, to 4 days uh, like almost a week's time to see the efficacy and you can see the difference of the stools like from day 1 to day 3 on the slide this is uh, another slide uh, for the same like 3 day treatment uh, along with the standard therapy it was given nitrate as a supplement and add on thing and you can see a huge difference in the stool consistency so how we recommended nitrate is basically to give twice in a day for the treatment of diarrhea but you like i mentioned in the video also like the most of the products we have they, they don't manage the gut health for a long term basis they are only like for acute diarrhea but uh, for like avoiding the relapses avoiding the recurrence of the digestive functions uh, we have a lot of things available then like uh, we recommend nitrate to be given as a dose rate like almost half tablet for per 5 kg for dogs like twice in a day uh, for like uh, every day for 3 days and if it is required you can extend the duration and you can give once in a day for like uh, for the maintenance of gut health and the same in case of cats so this is the short description to highlight basically you will see like we have uh, proven just what i think the paper is not seen sorry sorry so uh, we can see like uh, all the product what we have in natural remedies are like evidence based like i mentioned in the first slide but to ensure like the product is safe is having efficacy and it's having good palatability and we have enough evidences to prove it's safe and good efficacy so like this product and every product goes a preclinical trial we where we ensure we have a safety we have a efficacy study with the different prototypes even with the existing uh, products in the market we ensure we have the toxicity study done for both acute and chronic uh, studies then we have stability studies we have a good number of palatability study done to ensure it's palatable then once we do all these things we ensure like product undergoes a small uh, clinical trial but like the vets across india to check whether it's showing clinical efficacy or not after validating those things we ensure we have a clinical trial and we have done a clinical trial in mumbai veterinary college uh, for this product which is uh, done last year yeah, i will share the details of this so just to highlight what we did exactly in clinical trials you can see like we actually did a trial in two parts one was like for the treatment of diarrhea and was one for the maintenance of gut health so in treatment of diarrhea basically like the animal was given the standard therapy with the fluids according to the need of the patient and like along with that orally nitgut was given as a supplement over there for 3 days and animals were observed for total duration of 7 days to see the relapse and other things so as per the data we found like there was a huge difference after giving the nitgut along with the standard therapy as compared to the uh, control group which was receiving only standard therapy so the difference you can see there is a like a decrease in the fecal consistency score basically is the uh, score uh, waltham fecal scoring system we have used here so the more the watery higher the score lesser the like the consistency becomes solid it, the score was decreasing this is how we can see almost 34% the score was decreased 
And like in like the direct defecation, more than 60% improvement was seen. Like the numbers of direct defecations were reduced, and the vomition was also reduced, and the dehydration improved. And like other things, like they found like the animals treated with uh, night guard, they had a very good appetite. Almost 60% they had a good appetite, and activity level also increased. And like the best like body condition scores shows an improvement, but cannot be contributed directly to the night guard, but along with the standard therapy. And the best part, what we have observed, like most of the products they like supposed to help to recover the animal faster and we have found like dogs receiving standard therapy without night guard they took around five days to have a complete recovery maybe for appetite and other things whereas then the dogs receiving night guard along with standard therapy they recovered a day earlier in the treatment which is like very uh, good insight we have and that we can assure you can have a very good uh, supplement for the treatment of diarrhea then we had another uh, like study which was done to in the healthy animals to check whether like are they helping in the gut health management or not? So in this, we have done the study both with the pet pet observation and veterinary observation and both the uh, places we have found, like when we gave it a night gut regularly once in a day for minimum 28 days or a month's time, there was a like drastic improvement in the energy with the dogs which received the night gut therapy, like as a supplement every day basis, the body condition score of dog which were debilitated came to normal, became, uh, normal the fecal consistency score also improved and the appetite of the dogs also improved. So overall, we found like the night gut has a very good effect on the overall activity of the dogs, the body condition score, fecal consistency and appetite. And there was no direct defecation recorded. There was nothing abnormality recorded in the entire clinical trial. So we conclude with these two slides, like the night gut supplement, what we have is a very good supplement that can be recommended as a standard, along with standard therapy for the treatment of diarrhea. And it can be used as a uh, natural supplement, can be used for a long duration time to prevent a diarrhea and to increase the gut health also. So this is all about the night gut in short. I, I won't take much of your time. And like these are all the references. So any of uh, the participants or the vets across India and other parts are interested to know more about the product, we'll be happy to share all the information. Thank you so much. Over to you, sir. So uh, Cyrus sir will continue with the uh, other part of the presentation. Yep. Meantime, I'll request all the participants to uh, please uh, like give the questions in the question section so that like uh, we'll have uh, all the questions for discussion at the end of the session. I have to go back to square one. Give me, bear with me. No worries, sir. Yeah. Great. Uh, perfect. So, uh, I'm, I assume I'm audible. Is that correct? Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. You're audible. Proper audible. Yeah. yeah perfect. All right. So, uh, moving on from um, acute, uh, the acute diarrhea part to the chronic diarrhea part. Okay? And again, a chronic diarrhea part is is a is a part of the chronic enteropathy or what we used to call IBD reform. Right? And we do know that most of these IBDs are classified as diet or food responsive, antibiotic responsive, or more recently steroid responsive. Right? And uh, when we look at um, just chronic diarrhea and what's the prognosis, right? So if you look at uh, data uh, from very recent studies that have looked at it, in dogs with chronic diarrhea, about 71% of those dogs were had inflammation, so inflammatory bowel disease or chronic enteropathies. About 66% of them were diet responsive. 23% where you didn't have a cause, they were idiopathic, so either a fiber or a steroid responsive, and about 11% was antibiotic responsive. 13% were infectious, and only about 4% were cancer, right? Other causes of diarrhea uh, that we see uh, uh, from the pancreas was about 6%. Endocrine diseases like Addison's disease were about 2%. And overall, when we look at uh, diarrhea, uh, what's the prognosis for chronic diarrhea, we see that about 80%, 87% of dogs do improve or go into what we determine as clinical remission, right? But about 13% of dogs don't respond and they do die from the disease process. So it's not a bad disease to have, but um, uh, it, it can be challenging in some cases, right? 
And uh, the lack of recovery was usually seen in cases where it was IBD or cancer. And certain markers that told you that this was not going to improve was the evidence of anemia, low albumin, and low cobalamin. And when we talk about diets, and diets you know, are fundamental to, for managing diarrhea, uh, uh, especially the chronic ones, we talk about low-fat diets, they have the low residue diets that are easily uh, digestible, the novel protein diets, and we end up using rabbit, kangaroo, crocodile, um, uh, venison, you know, all different novel proteins that are not usually available, uh, the dog has, or cat has not seen. Then the hypoallergenic or the hydrolyzed diets where we, the protein is broken down. Right? The analogenic diets are the elemental diets where the protein is broken down into smaller pieces. And of course, the, uh, the group of people who believe in raw feeding and raw protein sources, which is not recommended personally by me. So this is, uh, again, from a more recent paper in 2020 that came out, um, talks about how you kind of pursue um, uh, chronic diarrhea. So it's a long process, you know. Uh, it's a stepwise process where you look at, rule out systemic causes versus um, gastrointestinal causes, uh, working through the process, and um, uh, kind of coming up with whether it's food-related inflammation, and then how you proceed to the end of getting biopsies. This is a pretty decent protocol. But more recently, there was another paper that was published um, where they looked at a low cost, a low cost protocol at the University of Mississippi for um, uh, chronic diarrhea in dogs and cats. And I think that's a very, very fair um, uh, protocol that makes sense because as a, when we work up cases of diarrhea, this becomes the best way to go approach. So week one, so week one, you have an animal that has diarrhea, Simplest thing, do your fecal examination. If you can't do a fecal examination or the fecal is even negative, it's still not wrong to uh, dewor deworm the animal, right? Uh, again, uh, uh, your fenbendazole, we use Panicure. I still use Panicure. I think it's one of my favorite drugs. Uh, or even choose a diet that has uh, a limited antigen or something like that, right? Uh, roundworms, whipworms, coccidia, the spirometra, and then along with just not just the deworming part, but making sure that along with that, you also uh, treat the environment so there's no re uh, reinfection. We see a lot of animals that get chronic resistant infections. Second week, if the diarrhea, there's no improvement in the diarrhea. Uh, week two, then you move on to making sure that there is nothing systemic going on. So blood work, complete blood counts, serum chemistry, including electrolytes, especially if you have a dog that's not doing well and you're worried about Addison's disease. At this point, if the blood work shows a, a, a condition where the this blood albumin is less than 1.8 uh, gram per deciliter, sorry about that, and or there's dehydration, weight loss, or the animal is not eating, that's the time where we need to switch into a more aggressive mode of, you know, going to diagnostics, right? Because that can be difficult. If the otherwise the dog is doing okay and the albumin is stable, right? Then you would continue with um, a, a change in the diet. You can try a probiotic and also try antibiotics. And one thing we'd like to use a lot is thylacin or Thailand, right? And uh, short doses of Thailand is useful for uh, week two, right? In week three, again, no improvement. Things are not going as you expected. And then this is where we think about, okay, so uh, we rule out systemic causes, we rule out parasites, and now we're moving into week three where we need to make sure, is there a pancreas problem involved? So looking at um, evidence of pancreatic um, uh, trypsin like immunoreactivity for uh, pancreatic insufficiency. The test is not available in India, but they do have a fecal elastase test that is available. Right? Uh, and then looking at other markers like cortisol, and then very importantly, uh, either supplementing or evaluating uh, things like cobalamin and folate, right? Cobalamin and folate, um, uh, cobalamin or B12 is a marker of chronic intestinal disease. So basically, if you look at this little picture, we do know that for cobalamin levels to be low in a dog, either the pancreas has to be a problem or there's a problem in the distal part of the small intestine, right? So if the cobalamin is taken in through food, it, you can see the little blue spots here. It binds to the dietary protein. It's broken down with the R protein. It moves into the small intestine, which is fine. As it reaches the, lot, at the end of the small intestine, it's very absorbed through the specific receptors into blood, right? 
So if there's any issue in these receptors because of inflammation, cancer, then the cobalamin level goes down. And cobalamin, we do know that it does help improve outcomes in chronic diarrhea. The same thing as folate. Folate is a marker of chronic small intestinal disease in the proximal small intestine, so the beginning, so your duodenum or jejunum, right? Folate is taken in through food, it's, it's attached to the receptors, it's broken down. Once it's broken down, um, it's absorbed by the uh, specific receptors in the small intestine. So again, cobalamin folate, when done in blood, is a surrogate marker of small intestinal uh, disease, right? So low folate tells you that the small, the duodenum or the proximal jejunum has an issue. A high folate tells you that you probably have more bad bacteria or a possible dysbiosis. A low cobalamin uh, is indicative of pancreatic or uh, bacterial dysbiosis, as well as distal intestinal disease like the ileum or the uh, distal jejunum. Right? So these are surrogate markers, and we do know that even if you don't test for them, supplementing them makes a big difference. We, uh, recently, we have seen that you know, just giving oral cobalamin or B12, which is relatively very inexpensive, right? Um, uh, for about 12 weeks does improve um, the bioavailability. In cats, we do 250 micrograms. In dogs, it's based on body weight, but anyway, it's between 250, 500, and 1,000 micrograms, uh, depending on their size for small, medium, and large dogs. And the best part about it is that um, there's very there's very minimal side effects, right? So back in the day or till very recently, we used to use injections, and it used to be weekly once injections for six weeks, then monthly, right? In cats, we do 250 micrograms. In dogs, we do uh, uh, anywhere between 250 to 1500, right? And in in the in most of Northern America, we use cyanocobalamin. I'm not really sure if it's available in India, but we back in the day we used to use methylcobalamin a lot. So I guess it, it is usable to some extent, but there's a slight difference of where the target is. Right? We also know that um, cobalamin is an appetite stimulant, and especially in cats where they don't eat, using cobalamin does have significant benefits. And then even if you give more cobalamin, there's very, very little chance that you're causing more harm than good. Again, with folate, we do know that folate, again, is a marker of small intestinal disease, specifically the duodenum and the jejunum, right? And again, till very recently, we never used to supplement them, but supplementing uh, folate in cats has been beneficial. Uh, it's same thing with dogs. It's very cheap, it's very affordable, it's very doable, and improves your outcomes. So again, if your dog or cat has diarrhea past the four to six week mark, and you live in an area where you have uh, fungal organisms like pythium, histoplasma, or even prototheca, then you know making sure that you put your hand in get a little piece of the rectum uh, and look at that to make sure there are no organisms present there switching your current diet trial changing a probiotic from a different strain adding in changing antibiotic from tylosin to metronidazole right and if it doesn't improve by week six right even if it the dog is stable then you're in trouble because i think we need to go into the next level of diagnostics uh, there are a few uh, breeds where we need to think a bit more proactively. For example, if you have an Irish setter that has small bowel diarrhea, then it is very imperative to consider a gluten-free trial because they get um, uh, uh, you know, issues with their gut because of their gluten sensitivity. Right? Same thing with the Yorkshire Terrier. If you have a Yorkshire Terrier that has intermittent diarrhea, it would not be wrong to do a low-fat diet. In breeds like the Norwegian Lunderhund, um, you know, we worry about um, the necrotic uh, or protein losing entropathy in German Shepherds, uh, digestive enzyme trials are not wrong. And then if you had a standard poodle or a Portuguese water dog, a Nova Scotia duck trolling retriever, I think diseases like Addison's should be high on your list. And then moving on to uh, if you have a primarily large bowel disease process, right? Again, uh, going back to square one, where it is mainly looking at your fecal floats. Um, uh, looking for parasites, Giardia, right? And then again, uh, uh, this is a whipworm that you can see, and it's never, never wrong for chronic diarrhea to deworm them, right? Uh, switch them to a diet that has a higher fiber, especially for the large bowel, right? And then also looking at a fecal sample, uh, not only for evidence of um, uh, 
parasite, but also doing a little stain to see if you have enough hospital organisms, right? And if there are, treating them for that with metronidazole, or if there's any GRDR, treating them for that as well. In large bowel diarrhea, there's a lot more uh, push towards using fiber, right? And uh, psyllium or metamucil is regularly used. You can do anywhere between half a tablespoon to three tablespoons, depending on per day, depending on the breed. Using probiotics to change the colonic microbiota as much as possible. So uh, again, week three, changing to a specific protein, adding more fiber, adding more probiotics. And week four, again, you switch your your probiotic. You can switch your antibiotic again to see if that helps. Um, and then changing your probiotic. Basically, simple, simple stuff that you can see you've eliminated causes for you to have further investigation. Again, if it pass, goes past six weeks, that raises a huge flag that you should stop there. And if you can do a fecal transplant, even in chronic diarrhea cases, it's not wrong too, but it, they've shown that it doesn't really help so much with chronic diarrhea as much as it helps with acute diarrhea. Again, there's a single exception uh, for large bowel diarrhea in uh, boxers, French bulldogs, and even some uh, 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 breeds where you have a lot of mucus and blood, usually the smush face breeds, where we worry about um, histocytic ulcerative colitis, which is caused by intra-invasive or intra-adherent E. coli. And what you see, basically, those animals that do respond from, respond from using a betrol or endrofloxacin, um, a fluoroquinolone for about six weeks, right? And what you see on the screen is basically adherent bacteria uh, because of the disease process. So if you have a large breed, a boxer or a Boston Terrier or a French Bulldog, uh, which has muco uh, bloody diarrhea for six weeks, then definitely consider an endrofloxacin trial before you do anything else. But very often, after you fail the six weeks uh, in, in, in empirical therapy in a stable patient, looking for advanced diagnostics like abdominal ultrasounds, looking for changes in the thickness of your gut, right? So. Is the lumen, is the mucosa thickened? Is the muscularis thickened? Is there lumps or bumps in the serosa that could indicate what's going on, uh, causing a diarrhea? Please remember that an ultrasound is a very poor diagnostic tool for diarrhea. In, you know, we, multiple shows of studies have shown that in about less than 15% of dogs, is ultrasound useful for coming up with a diagnosis or changing a treatment plan with diarrhea? except when there is weight loss or there's a mass palpable. That changes things. Like you can see from this picture, for example, the presence of an intersusception, the classical cut chapati, uh, as well, or when there is severe inflammatory disease like IBD or lymphoma in the cat. Next steps become, you know, where you proceed to do a biopsy, either surgically, endoscopically, or laparoscopically, and then this is the colon from a dog where you can see that multiple lesions switched for biopsied and came back with severe inflammation as well as uh, positive for fungal organisms, so, uh, depending on the area you, that, that you live in. And then, of course, the most important reason or the most important um, excuse to um, uh, uh, use steroids in chronic diseases, especially vomiting and diarrhea, is usually using steroids, uh, either pitocinide, prednisone, and then other uh, immunomodulators like azathioprine, mycophenolate. I do use cyclosporin a lot, but it becomes really expensive in large breed dogs. Chlorambucil is a chemotherapy drug we use a lot in cats. And then we rarely use sulfasalicine or the amino salicylic acids for colitis because it doesn't really help in my experience. With that, I think I'm on time and I will stop. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much. It was really good insights for all the things you have shown. So uh, we have a lot of questions been asked. So definitely, I'll go through the questions uh, one by one. So, okay. uh, so to start with, like, uh, like we have like something been asked regarding like uh, what is the uh, protocol for treating IBD in cats? Like uh, specifically, is there anything? So um, again, um, uh, I see the question, and it, it is a very difficult question, but simply is because we don't understand this disease at all. So inflammatory bowel disease in cats, lymphoma, small cell lymphoma is very poorly understood, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is one of the most recent papers that came out showed that you took 
healthy cats that were get dental examinations and we biopsied their gut. They all came back as lymphoma or IBD, but the cats had no clinical signs, right? And they followed these cats for weeks to years, and they found that these animals had did not develop clinical signs. So our understanding of lymphoma or IBD is very poor. We don't know what causes it. We don't know how to do it, right? So my protocol is in, uh, in cats is depending on how sick they are, right? So if the cat is stable, I, I, I play with diet and antibiotics. So usually I do two diets. I do a novel protein, so rabbit um, or venison or kangaroo or something that the animal has never seen. Uh, and I do a hydrolyzed diet. So two diets, two weeks apart. I do tylosin. Usually I don't use metronidazole, right? And so, and then I make sure that they are dewormed. So a course, a five-day course of fenbendazole. And then uh, either testing or treating with B12 and folate, right? Uh, because that does change things. And if that doesn't work, uh, say, into four weeks in, there's no improvement, vomiting, diarrhea, weight loss, right? Then I offer two options. One option is going the empirical trial. So we try something like budesonide. Most cats get half a milligram to one milligram of oral budesonide daily, right? And we use body weight and clinical science to see how we improve. If it is um, a cat, an owner who wants to know for sure and make sure there's no lymphoma present, we offer endoscopy mm -hmm. or we open a full thickness biopsy surgically, right? And usually, uh, if that's not feasible, um, uh, then we say, you know, if they, and the cat is really sick, we normally go to prednisone initially, two milligram per kilogram body weight uh, once a day. Again, monitor for clinical signs. And then if that fails, we also add in chlorambucil, which is a chemo drug. We use it two milligrams, Lucran, two milligrams, uh, mm -hmm. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, monitoring blood and stuff. Okay. Great. So I hope like uh, we are able to satisfy because this question was asked by our like senior vet doctor Dhananjay Pandit only. Yeah. So I hope we are able to I satisfy. Have to and... yes, so uh, we have another question was uh, regarding like what diet changes should be done in apparently healthy dogs suffering from diarrhea. In acute diarrhea, there is no real reason to change diet, right? The, the, if as far as the diet, the animal has had a normal stool before on the diet, there's no indication to change the diet, right? Acute diarrhea, again, for multiple purposes, we, there's no real reason to change it unless the animal does not improve, right? For example, the animal does not bounce back in three to five days, then a diet trial can be concerned. Usually, and again, it depends, you know, sometimes low fat. So if you're having uh, uh, digestible issues, you're throwing up or your pancreas is inflamed, using a low fat diet or a bland diet like they use in human beings would not be wrong. But um, most part, the goal is to get back, them back on a more balanced diet down, um, down the line. Fair enough. Thank you, doctor. So uh, another question was uh, regarding like what uh, can be used in case of ulcerative colitis in cats? Ulcerative colitis is not established as a disease process in cats. We do get cats that have um, uh, blood in the stool or, um, uh, you know, straining to defecate large bowel signs, right? Uh -huh. And uh, most part, we, we don't call it ulcerative colitis because that's a very boxer-driven disease. Because there is uh, a, a basically it is a it is a continuum of an infectious process. So it's it, it, it's bad E. coli or uh, adherent E. coli that causes the problem. In cats, basically we get colitis, is which is usually a manifestation of um, large bowel inflammatory bowel disease or lymphoma, both the same thing, right? The spectrum. Uh, uh -huh. So basically, in those cases. Um, the most important thing we do is it's changing the uh, protein source, uh, mm -hmm. adding more fiber, right? So we do know cats also are fiber responsive um, using either mm -hmm. canned pumpkin, psyllium husks, as well as, um, and sometimes steroids do help, uh, if especially if there's a strong inflammatory component. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the concern becomes in cats is also, some people believe, again, uh, very few, there are very few nutritionists who believe that doing an absolutely pure protein diet sometimes mm -hmm. does help. So or doing only a pure protein diet, which is never balanced normally, but that does help as a trial. Mm -hmm. um, the Hill bio diet has been used extensively in cats mm -hmm. in uh, this part of the world. I think it's in India as well. Mr. Pandit yeah. can help, Dr. Pandit can help you with that. 
but yeah. um, that also has helped with um, colitis in cats. Great, great. Thank you. So uh, another question was regarding like an apparently healthy cat has fresh blood in stools over a long time, negative for Giardia and has been deworm. So like uh, what we can suspect for? So when you say fresh blood, right? And again, um, so when I uh, when I ask for when I evaluate a case of colitis or fresh blood, I have them send me pictures of the stool because what happens is if the blood is on the outside, so the mm -hmm. stool is formed and the blood is on the outside, that means there is a mucosal lesion. So there is something on the surface, on the inside mm -hmm. line of the colon, that's causing an erosion or ulceration. Right? Very often that can be cancer. If it is chronic, right, and it uh, or it could be a polyp, it could be something low. If the whole stool is not formed and there's blood mixed with it, that is a more diffuse process, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's one. I think you need some sort of localization and a rectal exam to make sure because very often polyps, um, uh, even cancer, sometimes can look like that. Uh, but for the most part, if you take, go across the globe, it is usually colitis, and uh, most animals, it's lack of fiber. For the most okay. part, great. And steroids. Usually, we end up using steroids at the end of it. Definitely. Thank you, Dr. Butter. So, uh, another thing is like uh, one question regarding a case they have asked like a GSD, a German Shepherd, age 11 months, had acute diarrhea, which got corrected with uh, a neutralin B uh, and other treatment, but recurring after 25 to 38 days for third time. Like, say, how to deal with this kind of cases? What is neutralin? Uh, it's, it's it's a kind of probiotic uh, preparation, sir. Okay, and other yes, the other treatments. I don't know. I see the question um, uh, from Dr. Lokesh. Uh, basically, in German shepherds, right? So German shepherd dogs are the poster children of gastroenterology. So exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is um, is very common. So pancreatic enzyme uh, deprivation. Mm -hmm. So any German Shepherd where you have chronic intestinal disease, it is it is a very high suspicion. So it's not wrong to try digestive enzymes if there's recurrent issues. The other disease that we see very commonly in German Shepherds are is antibiotic responsive diarrhea. So this is uh, usually um, a group of dogs that require an antibiotic for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for most cases, it's tylosin, that's because that's what the Helsinki group came out with, and that's what we use normally because it's not absorbed in the body. Um, so tylosin, usually for German Shepherds, what I, we do is we start with 10 to 15 milligram per kilogram twice mm -hmm. a day. We keep it on for about three months or more. And then mm -hmm. we reduce it once a day. Some, some German Shepherds stay on tylosin for the rest of their life. Okay. It's just the way they are. It's not, it's not good medicine, but it's just what they need. They've, they've shown that you know if you use probiotics, it doesn't really help the dogs that require tylosin. So usually, mm -hmm. you, for most part, in shepherds, it's, it is an antibiotic responsive or pancreatic insufficiency. We also know they have a poor immune system with IgA deficiencies, especially in younger dogs. Mm -hmm. And I would also look out liver disease in small young dogs like 11 months, which can mm -hmm. look very similar to what we have. Great. Great. So uh, thank you, doctor. Like uh, another question we have, uh, like one of our senior vet uh, from medicine, Dr. Samad, sir. He has asked regarding like, what is your experience regarding like uh, using bovine colostrum or egg, uh, like in IGY. case of you know, in, for diarrhea patients? Sir. I, I don't have any experience to be very honest with you. Um, bovine colostrum has, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, the alternative therapy group has used a lot of bovine colostrum and stuff for that. Um, it's I, there's no data. I don't have any data to uh, to say yay or nay. Uh -huh. uh, the whole idea is that you know it's um, uh, it's trying to reduce your bacterial viral load. Um, I don't uh, have any data. I can't help you there. <laughs> but there, there's a lot of people looking to those stuff. But I don't think there's any uh, concrete data. Okay. Okay. So and what about eggs? Uh, if uh, normally are given. It's just a protein source, so we cook them always. So it's it's yeah. it's the I, the IGY is useless because it's it's denatured, mm -hmm. right? So there's no yeah. benefit in unless it's given, um, and it, the stomach acid will denature it as well. So I'm not sold on it has having any positive experience personally. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So uh, there's another like uh, been asked by uh, like, do you carry out any pre fecal transplant test uh, in case of donor pets? 
specifically? I did. I did. <laughs> uh, very often, what so our thumb when we do it here is we make sure that they have a negative um, fecal panel. So we look for Clostridium. We look for um, Salmonella, Campylobacter, Yersinia, GRD, uh -huh. Cryptosporidium. So it's an enteric panel that is across the board, which which is usually has to come back negative. We do an okay. uh, a fecal parasite count, uh, so that also has to come back negative, right? We also uh -huh. make sure that the animal has had no clinical signs in the past uh, uh, six months of no diarrhea, no antibiotics, no supplements, no special diets for the most part, right? Uh -huh. And uh, the recently, I've also started using cobalamin and folate blood levels to see if whether that is acceptable because those are surrogate markers. So uh -huh. I use a lot of um, uh, B12 and folate testing before I say this is a good donor candidate. We normally use one donor and we use the donor for life. So we keep screening them every six months, right? Okay. Uh, and we use them. We, we can also store the feces. So there's enough data that's come out from the Texas group suggesting that you can keep the feces in the fridge or freezer for about, I mean, it's in the fridge for 14 days. If you're freezing them, adding glycerol to the mixture okay. so you can have it in your freezer for long periods of time. There are companies that will sell you the dog feces uh, as biome supplements, the animal biome group, right? Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, and there are, the, the Ohio State University is working on a fecal bank right now. So there's a lot of places where there's a huge potential for this. Okay, great. So a uh, few uh, points like have been added by Samut sir, like he, he has said like normally this egg yolk like IGY is now available as like a hyperimmune or a purified and enteric coated form. So I think that, that can be given something for diarrhea treatment. So uh, just an insight he gave. Uh, so, uh, Anand, yeah. I don't have any experience with it. I'm sure. Uh... Yeah. So uh, fair enough, sir. Like uh, we have another uh, questions regarding like uh, some drugs to be used. So one of them I've asked like, can we use sulfur drugs in cats? I think I have a lot of other choices that I would use before you use sulfur in cats uh, mm -hmm. because I use, use sulfur for you know the Albion we use for cryptospor I mean coccidia but mm -hmm. I mean for general uses there's so many other better drugs in the market right mm -hmm. and I think in India you guys are, in India you guys have a lot more options for drugs than in Canada for antibiotics because it's the uh, but I mean unless there's an absolute need why use something that can cause more damage and if you're referring to using uh, the sulfa drugs for the colon, mm -hmm. I've used it in one cat that did not go very well. So I would probably, I think cats are wonderful with steroids if you can, and you don't have the risk of diabetes. So I would probably use that. And the sulfa drugs are not miracle workers in the colon. So I would avoid that as much as possible. Fair enough, sir. So uh, there's one question regarding like uh, the safety of nadgats. Uh, they have asked uh, like whether it's safe given. So I like to add like uh, see nadgat. We have like uh, safety data available to show it's like safe in like uh, any age group and it can be given continuously as the need of the treatment. So definitely no need to worry about safety of nadgat for sure. Uh, so like another question like regarding like can we use fenbendazole for five days? Uh, any side effects? No, I so fenbendazole is, is my drug of choice. I use it for five days, three to five days, easy. Fifteen milligrams per body weight for dogs and cats with food, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In cases of uh, lung worms, so when we have lung parasites, I use it for fourteen days. I have never had an issue of, at all. Albendazole, fabantil, I mean all the other ones. There are issues if you use a long word. Fenbendazole is approved for use for fourteen days, easy at fifty mm -hmm. milligram per kilogram. Oh, great. Uh, uh, another thing like regarding this fecal microbial transplant, like uh, they have asked like how we can conduct this, like. Uh... It is very simple. So it is, you know, it is something that I, uh, which it should be, it can be done, you know, at any hospital. There's no excuse not to do it. What you okay. need is to, you need to get a good donor. So, you know, a dog that, or a cat that has good stools, make mm -hmm. sure it's as fresh as possible for the morning off, right? Mm -hmm. or uh, the you have in the fridge and use it as soon as possible. So we take two gram per kilogram of feces. We put it in a, we actually get a mixie for this a blender. Mm -hmm. We put it in, we, we dilute it one is to five with, um, with saline or water, tap water, right? 
and mm -hmm. you blend it up so there are no um, what do you call it no uh, chunks in present in it you filter it with the uh, you know the uh, the strainer the uh, what we use for tea mm -hmm. strain it out so it's just liquid uh, uh, make a solution up you know 10 mil per kg of body weight so it's a five kilogram dog come up to 50 mils or slightly less right uh, take a red rubber catheter like a simple uh, urinary catheter uh, don't I mean use water lube it up the butt um, and then inject it very uh, normally don't force your um, catheter just inject it inject the complete volume ideally stay below 10 mil per king because the more you push into the colon there will be an increased uh, um, tendency to go have a bowel movement right so stay below 10 and then just leave it there uh, leave the dog in a small carrier or small cage for two to three hours but it would kick in. Do not feed the animal for about six hours, so there's no uh, gastrocolic reflex. But it's a very, very simple thing. Uh, we do it a lot in parvo puppies, uh, mm -hmm. especially if they're really sick. Oh, that's really good insight. Uh, another thing, like uh, we have a question regarding, like, uh, can you please advise, like, type of dietary management we can add up for dogs with parvo viral gastroenteritis? So. Uh, I'm assuming this is, I guess there are two questions. Is this because of the acute phase? So when they are sick in hospital, is that is that the question I assume, Shiva? Uh, so basically, uh, I don't do parvo because uh, it's in critical care. It goes into emergency. I don't do uh, parvo. But normally when we do parvo, is usually the whole idea is that we feed the animal as soon as possible, right? So okay. if the dog is, uh, the moment the dog can start eating or drinking, starting mm -hmm. uh, trickle. So even few drops of food, um, um, you know, mm -hmm. either offering it to them and have them eat. Uh, if they're throwing up a lot, we put a little nasogastric tube in and sure make sure the stomach is empty. And mm -hmm. we use that tube to trickle. So anything that's lightly digestible, even your pedialyte solution, so electrolytes with um, amino acids, you know, mm -hmm. simple uh, non flavored ones, uh, or any digestible puppy diet, you know, is something that we can use or you can blend it in, the mix, in your mixy and use it. But mm -hmm. that's what we use for the most part. Uh, okay. Once they are uh, once they are above, once they are out of the acute phase, mm -hmm. we put them in a pup stand, standard puppy diet because they need to. Um, uh, they do need to go back to uh, getting as much nutrition as possible because of the damages to the intestinal lining. Fair enough. Thank you, thank you, doctor. So another thing regarding like uh, the non-infectious cause, basically they have uh, Dr. Dhananjay Pandit has asked regarding like the stress has a cause of diarrhea. Like how do you deal with uh, this uh, stress-related diarrhea in dogs and cats? So uh, uh, stress can cause diarrhea. So we do know that um, uh, we don't know the it's not IBS, so it's not irritable bowel syndrome, but mm -hmm. it's actually uh, where there is this is basically. We don't understand the disease process well. You know the dogs that go to a, a kennel, dogs that come from a kennel where there are changes in your household, where there are animals that move into a shelter, right? Uh -huh. So, or there is uh, changes at home. So those things do happen, and we do see that animals breaking out diarrhea. They come to the veterinary doctor and they go home. The next two days they have diarrhea. So uh -huh. in those easy worked up animals or dogs that are not socialized. Sometimes putting them on the probiotics, so that's where we have enough data from um, the, uh, uh, you know, using a single strain like um, uh, Enterococcus fecium or the Portiflora from Purina has shown that, you know, using those things as, as prophylaxis does help, right? Um, uh, 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 in cats also to some extent, but you know, for the most part, it does, there is some benefit, right? Um, okay. uh, but is this a cause and effect? Does every single animal that has that issue have to go in on a on a probiotic? We really don't know. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. Fair enough. So, uh, yeah. So uh, the next question was regarding like uh, we have a post diarrheal rectal prolapse in puppies. Like how to control this? <laughs> I, I think unless you control the underlying problem, so uh, there's no the rectal prolapse is. Uh, so I think when I see rectal prolapse, there are three things. One is make sure there is you can put make sure there's no intussusception because that's very very common, and it is missed very easily when you have parvo. So every day palpating the belly, morning and evening, making sure that you don't find a sausage like roll in the puppy. Right. Uh, second is controlling uh, inflammation and controlling uh, uh, you know controlling the uh, diarrhea per se, right? 
we all, sometimes, you know, if the diary is really bad, uh, you know, and depending on the nursing abilities that are available, right? Sometimes in severe cases, they do put um, a Foley catheter in the bum, like uh, mm -hmm. practically, and mm -hmm. keep a urinary bag, like how you put the urine, because it just comes shooting out, right? And it becomes a huge nursing issue, especially if you have dogs and uh, other cats that can get infected in the same environment, right? So usually for dogs, not for cats, but they do use a Foley rectally just to um, prevent things from uh, getting messy, right? But for rectal mm -hmm. prolapse, there's nothing much you can do. Okay. Unless making sure there is no problem there. And one thing I always did back in Bangalore as well is making sure these puppies are dewormed. You will get a parvo positive test, but very often it's very common these puppies have hookworms or um, tapeworms or not sorry hookworms or um, uh, roundworms and also trichurus right so just because your fecal sample is negative does not mean there are no parasites mm -hmm. so it's not all it's not always wrong to have um, uh, making sure that you have an, uh, uh, an anti-parasitic on your protocol especially depending if they came from a breeder or a shelter or things like that mm -hmm. perfect Perfect. So uh, specifically, uh, someone has asked, like, uh, what is the best antibiotics uh, recommended for paroviral enteritis? Actually, uh, it's interesting that, you know, um, when I was back home, we used to use antibiotics. We used to use septioxone, like water, when I worked back home. But yeah. none of none of the abroad use antibiotics for parvo unless the white cell count is down. Right. So yeah. actually, there's no real indication to use antibiotics in viral gastroenteritis unless you have uh, evidence of se sepsis coming up so or mm -hmm. you have the animals are septicemic so or increase decrease white cell count neutropenia right mm -hmm. uh, and here in the in even in even in the states most of them will be using uh, things like uh, amoxicillin um, uh, I mean, amoxicillin iv or metronidazole we never use with the higher guns at all like ceftriaxone mm -hmm. or um, and we didn't use betrol in puppies because of the uh, bone growth issues, but um, yeah. so it's very rare to see a parvo case with antibiotics. Antibiotics, so less preferred unless until it's a, like a severe infectious condition present. But I, so, I, I, uh, I, that, I do think there's a difference, you know, in uh, the way we, there's a protocol from Colorado State University for outpatient care of parvo, right? And we used to use sulfur actually a lot. Sulfur, the injectable sulfurs, the biotrim, mm -hmm. I believe. Well, yeah, we used to use that because it used to take care of coccidia as well, which is another thing that you can miss in parvo puppies. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. so uh, uh, we have another question. Like they have asked, like some drugs have uh, diarrhea as its side effects when we give for some other uh, therapy. So how to diagnose or differentiate whether the diarrhea is due to a specific drug or like uh, some other thing? There's no way. So if it is a drug induced, for example, cyclosporin can cause vomiting in diarrhea in dogs. We use it for vomiting in diarrhea in dogs for IBD, right? Or in cats. The only way to know it's drug induced is to stop the drug and see what happens. The yeah. problem also happens when, when you, for example, if you use, um, if you don't, a lot of times we see what we see in medicine is when an animal goes for orthopedic surgery, like a TPLO, they get a shot of they get antibiotics for um, that problem. And then after that, they have continuous diarrhea where there is no improvement at all. And that's because a dysbiosis has been started, right? And so the, if something has changed in the in the body, so there is no improvement there. And that's where things like probiotics, fecal transplants, and things need to come into play, right? But once the shift happens, mm -hmm. it can be permanent for life, unfortunately. So antibiotics are not benign. Okay, fair enough. So, like, definitely all drugs they come up with certain side effects. We have to monitor those specifically. So, uh, there are like uh, questions regarding like which specifically in which type of diarrhea metronidazole is can be preferred, and can prednisolone be given with metronidazole in that condition? Uh, sorry, I missed the first part of the question. I guess uh, which uh, type of diarrhea metronidazole can be preferred, and can prednisolone be uh, clubbed with metronidazole uh, for the treatment? So um, ideally, like I said, uh, if you look, if you're trying to be a purist, right? So if you're trying to be a purist for di acute diarrhea, we don't need antibiotics, period. If you're positive for uh, GRDR or you have a severe colitis, it's not wrong to try metronidazole or thylacine, right? But it also kills mm -hmm. healthy bacteria. Any, any antibiotic that you use has an effect on the microbiome or there's a dysbiosis, right? So there's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for me, for normally when I do this, you can give prednisone and metronidazole together. There is no issues. Uh, we use mm -hmm. it like 
we do that very often, right? But the only time we use prednisone is when we have established there is an there's a chronic component. We need an anti-inflammatory. It's not for the run of the mill mm -hmm. diarrhea. This is a diarrhea that is six weeks in. We know there is an immune component. There is IBD or there's chronic enteropathy, and then we use that. But otherwise, we never use um, uh, steroids together, right? It's not a short term use. It's usually chronic and long term. Yeah. Great, fair enough. So uh, another thing, like, can we use uh, doxycycline for chronic diarrhea? And like, how many days we can recommend? And what can be the dose? I I don't recommend doxycycline for uh, chronic diarrhea uh, because because you know again, it, I guess uh, the chronic diarrhea has to be better defined, right? Uh, back in the day, or certain countries like the UK, they use oxy tetracycline, which is not doxycycline. There's a difference because. Um, <laughs> uh, so the, the excretion is slightly different, right? So the old oxytetracycline orally, like you know what we use in uh, large animal medicine, the problem with that is mm -hmm. it is really hard in the stomach. It is really hard on yeah, any animal. If any of you have taken uh, oxytetracycline orally, it is really um, because severe gastritis can cause diarrhea itself. So it doesn't really help to use a drug that has very minimal benefit and it's a very big gun. And especially, uh, I know in Kerala and in Bangalore we have a lot of tick-borne diseases, right? and where you use doxycycline uh, as water. So you don't really want to use a group of drugs where you need it for higher life-saving processes, right? For something like diarrhea, which might not get a lot of improvement. So I would mm -hmm. save that I would save that drug for a uh, rainy day. Yeah, <laughs> not recommended for diarrhea specifically. God. So uh, would acid or uh, like pepsin and trypsin uh, not harm the bacteria given orally? Like uh, this is so much sir. Last. Sorry, can can you repeat the question, please? Ah, yeah. So uh, the acid, uh, like gastric acid or like pepsin or trypsin, will they harm the bacteria when we give orally, like the probiotics, basically? Uh, good question. <laughs> so most of the um, uh, the probiotics that are given are usually encapsulated, and uh, they are in a form that I believe should bypass the stomach, right? That's why also we don't have a lot of data. Uh, in the veterinary formulations, because usually um, it should bypass the gut, bypass the stomach acid, hit the intestine where you have the maximum bacterial load and disintegrate there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there is, we do know the stomach is not sterile. We know it's not sterile uh, as we used to believe it to be, right? And um, mm -hmm. the question is how many organisms uh, bypass it because uh, it's still unknown to some extent, but. Uh, so but the, there is a significant difference in the number of organisms that get destroyed in the stomach. So that is a huge issue with um, um, the same thing, uh, you know, microbes going in. Right? I don't know if you noticed, but a lot of uh, the, some of the veterinary ones and some of the human um, uh, probiotics that are used are actually refrigerated. So one of the ones that we use extensively in North America, which is it's called Visi Biome or VSL3, it is a lactobacillus group, uh, which has mm -hmm. about and billions and billions of bacteria, but that has to be kept in the fridge. You can pick it up over the counter, but it has mm -hmm. to be kept in the fridge because it's a live culture, right? And so, and that, and they are very specific for a way you take it because you have to take it with a liquid or that empties very quickly, or you have to take it with um, uh, a capsule that has very micro encapsulations and stuff like that. So it is a live culture. Mm -hmm. It's like going to your microbiology lab and picking up a bacterial culture and drinking it. Yeah. Fair enough. So it's still a questionable, like how much it actually reaches the intestine. <clears throat> no, and that's the, that's the biggest uh, issue, right? And that's why uh, uh, some people, um, we actually, you know, if you look at this one paper that came out where they use, in human beings, they do the fecal transplants when you're under, and when you're having an upper endoscopy. So they actually put a scope in, they go past your uh, stomach, and then they inject mm -hmm. the fecal bacteria there. So that means, so the bacteria can work there. So when they do an uh, uh, upper scope, right? So yeah. eventually it will come to us as well. Yeah, definitely. So uh, there's another question like, can uh, diphenoxylate be used in secretory diarrhea in cats? And at what can be the dose rate? I, I don't like stopping diarrhea. I, I think, you know, a, the same principle from human medicine is that if you utilize, you use lopramide or diphenoxylate or any of those groups, the purpose, you, you're trying to reduce diarrhea. Um, uh, that is a body's response of telling you, I'm getting rid of something that does not belong to me, right? 
Um, <laughs> any of the drugs that are used to control diarrhea, except for the symptomatic ones, your your kaolin pectin, pectins, all those things which help to prevent the absorption, right, or close the secretory mm -hmm. surface, it's it's mm -hmm. not ideal because uh, you could lead to buildup of toxins. For example, if you have an infectious diarrhea and, for example, mm -hmm. camp, uh, clostridium, right, and you stop the diarrhea and all the toxins are building up, you're going to have a septicemic patient, right? So uh, even in animals where you are pouring out diarrhea like every minute, every hour, um, I think it's mm -hmm. not fair uh, to use a, a, a mortality uh, reducer because it can be yeah. fatal. Uh, you can, uh, like, you know, we do do use a few drugs for mortality, um, like atropine or something like that, in very yeah. severe cases, but it's never more than once, just to yeah. make sure that we get some time to get fluids in before the animal dies. But yeah. I would never, ever recommend stopping chronic diarrhea with a mortality modifiers. There is one recent paper that came out, with, with they have shown that sometimes you can have increased bile acids and you can use something like chlori um, cholestyramine which is a um, uh, what we use for statins so mm -hmm. that can be used for diarrhea so there are many other things to control and look at but mm -hmm. uh, you know versus trying something to stop something which is very, can be very fatal yeah so we should not uh, like uh, like do anything for the motility as far as it is concerned unless it is a <laughs> unless it's a motility problem right so there yeah. are uh, very rare cases where it's a primary motility problem like in mm -hmm. IBS, we do mm -hmm. anti anxiolytics We also mm -hmm. have a form of epilepsy in the gut, uh, the limbic epilepsy, where you have uh, changes to your motility, right? But those are drugs where those are very rare conditions where we use mm -hmm. motility modifiers, but that's used very, very carefully. Exactly. Thank you. So, uh, there's a question like, can we offer milk to a pup uh, suffering from diarrhea? Uh, I mean, uh, to be very honest, the problem is, you know, um, uh, there's a there's a difference in the approach in the Western world and, you know, back home, right? You know, back home, I've used milk in my puppies and cats and they've done fine, you know. But if you look at the Western world, they don't have they don't have the lactase enzyme. There's a lot of issues about whether it's useful or not. Right? The the standard rule for any digestive uh, disturbance is to use a diet that is a very bland, low in fat, right? So if you used um, a rice, for example, a low fat, well digestible diet would be like what we consider the white diet, right? So the white diet is mm -hmm. basically uh, rice or baked potato or pasta, mm -hmm. right? With mm -hmm. that's the carbohydrate source. And then you use either boiled chicken, uh, mm -hmm. uh, boiled fish, the tilapia, mm -hmm. boiled mm -hmm. ultra low fat, fat cheese or um, even low fat turkey so those are the things so two parts of the two parts of the sorry two parts of the uh, uh, carbohydrate to one part of the protein right and this mixture is about 150 kilocalories so that's what we normally recommend like if you want a bland diet right? mm -hmm. but um, milk uh, you know it can go the other way as well because human milk is i mean cow milk is not as digestible people have used goat milk because of the the fat molecules being smaller and stuff like that but mm -hmm. I mean, dogs really need milk, you know. Mm -hmm. so I, okay. I, I, it, it, it often it leads to osmotic uh, diarrhea. Mm -hmm. If this is, I don't think it really helps. <laughs> okay. So, uh, like, uh, there's a question from Dr. Nanjan Dappa. Like, uh, he has specifically asked, like, uh, uh, he said, like, I know it's uh, not a specific question for today's topic, but he want to know, like, any specific strategy to save a Rottweiler or a Doberman from Parvo, like, uh, <laughs> uh, how are you? Um, so, um, I'm sure, uh, you know, we see uh, what the ones that are most affected, right? The not in the right? It, 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 it was a first when I was at Par uh, in Cuba as well. Uh, it, it was always a challenge to get these dogs under control. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, basically, I think, you know, being uh, being proactive with vaccines, right? And also biocontrol, right? Making sure these animals come from a very reputable breeder, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, by, by, you know, like how we do social distancing in for mm -hmm. COVID-19. The same thing with dogs and cats, like, you know, unless they're fully vaccinated, making sure that nobody else comes in, no other dogs mixes, breeders, dog shows, all the same thing are very important mm -hmm. because the parvo strains are getting um, crazier. Mm -hmm. um, and fatal. So I, I think one thing that uh, I don't think is being done very commonly back home is, is fecal transplants. And if you look at the paper that came out by Dr. Wies and the Brazilian group is 
there's a huge response and we're, we're seeing it clinically, right? So it's not something wrong to try. So doing fecal transplants, uh, I can send the Naveen the paper. It's, on, it's, it's an open access paper in uh, Journal of Veterans Journal of Medicine where they've seen a significant improvement uh, and there's something definitely not wrong to try. Early yes, nutrition. You know, early nutrition is uh, one thing, you know, uh, trickle feeding, nasogastric intubation, uh, putting, getting food in uh, would be the other thing. Um, we, with respect to yeah. all the other stuff, you know, it's all questionable, you know, because all the other therapies that we've done, the antivirals, the interferons, the everything, mm -hmm. all those things are still debatable. Uh, but it's aggressive support, being on top of things, uh, getting in, them early in, and then making sure there are no common disease. But I, there's no miracle cure. I think we yeah. lost a part of the puppy last um, day before yesterday in the clinic, actually, as well. Uh, it was a puppy from another place, but it was, you know, the paro, it was, it had 0 0.1 neutrophils. There's nothing much you can do there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, thank you for that, doctor. Like, uh, another question was regarding, like, uh, what do you suggest in treatment of diarrhea other than antibiotics? I think it's a repetition, like, uh, you have already answered uh, those things. And, yeah. So, can we, devom and uh, antibiotics can be prescribed together in one go, or should we, uh, there be a gap in prescribing these two drugs? It, it for me it depends you know it depends on the urgency for example if the animal is stable deworm and go uh, go after a few days but mm -hmm. usually i do this most of the animals that come to me you know they're in that bush of breaking so i do it together and it's usually not a big deal okay fair enough so uh, this is another question like uh, if there is this biases in diarrhea like uh, like can antibiotic recommend can we like recommend antibiotic uh, along with that? We we know that there is dysbiosis in diarrhea. All the yeah. studies that have come out have shown that whether it's acute or chronic, mm -hmm. there is dysbiosis. The thing is also shown that you know in left alone with doing nothing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the the dysbiosis comes back to eubiosis without mm -hmm. doing anything else, right? So mm -hmm. uh, the intervention the has to be calculated because it might not give you the benefit that you require. Uh -huh, uh -huh. They have shown that in acute hemorrhagic gastroenteritis in dogs. So uh, from the European group that using clavulanic acid uh -huh. or using metronidazole actually may improve clinical signs, but induces a chronic state of dysbiosis and antibiotics are not indicated. So antibiotics can actually do more harm than good. So Great. unless there is evidence that the animal is going to have gastrointestinal um, what do you call it? Uh, translocation because uh -huh. the bacteria are going to move from the gut into the bloodstream, right? Where you have a neutropenia or sepsis, uh -huh. then it's not really indicating the acute phase. Got it. Got it. So uh, I, I think, Dr. Yeah, yeah, tell me. Sorry, please, please. one thing I will mention is you know, uh, th there is a huge push in certain countries that for antibiotic stewardship, so not use unnecessary antibiotics, right? But uh -huh. on, on the other side, you know, if my dog at home has diarrhea for five days and I'm cleaning up, getting up in the middle of the night, I do understand that there's a, you know, because animals get uh, euthanized, animals get uh, surrendered because of, you know, chronic uh -huh. issues, right? So uh -huh. if there is, um, uh, you know, while trying to be the best uh, practitioner by not using antibiotics unnecessarily, but it's not wrong to use a gut hunting antibiotic if you need it, right? And there are animals like, you know, the German Shepherd we talked about where uh -huh. you require antibiotics of a low potency long term, right? It's it is uh -huh. the nature of the game. Right? And but and the whole idea is that we use it judiciously. So the acute direct case that walks through the door does not get an antibiotic, but something that is chronic, something that is more potent, uh -huh. that animal needs it and will need it for the rest of their life. So definitely. Thank and you. Doctor. I'm not against antibiotics. If I need it, I use it. But the thing is that, you know, uh, we've also seen animals that, you know, got, got a dental and they got clindamycin or they got something of claviceptin and that's, or T, a TPLO and they get, they go into this phase where they have severe diarrhea for the rest of their life because the bacteria has been changed. And to get that back to normal with the antibiotics that we have is virtually impossible. Oh. Great. We have a last question uh, again, like raised by Dr. Pandit. Like he has asked, like can Clostridium uh, difficile be considered as an indicator organism in IBD? <laughs> Interesting question. Um, uh, so I, I I don't think uh, for IBD. So classical definition of IBD is that there is no causative organism, right? Mm -hmm. 
So if uh, the uh, chronic enteropathy or IBD, the definition is that there is no identifiable cause and there is inflammation, right? So if there is a cause present, then uh, IBD is off the table, right? Okay. Um, so uh, because then you would treat, you wouldn't go after, um, uh, you would treat for Clostridium difficile, right? The problem here is that um, the Clostridium group, we do know that they cause the, there is some evidence, not full evidence, that mm -hmm. they have a net F gene that can cause hemorrhagic gastroenteritis in um, certain dogs and cats for the mm -hmm. acute group. And so that is a group that changes uh, the, the Clostridialis group changes when this dysbiosis. And so the number of bacteria that are present can be altered, right? But we really don't know if the lack of, um, uh, you know, the organism is what uh, causes it or the presence of the organism. It's not the chicken or the egg, unfortunately, right? So. Uh, they have shown that, you know, in, for example, in some cats where you had mm -hmm. IBD or chronic injuries that they found Campylobacter, right? And mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it was a neutrophilic uh, IBD. So the question is, is Campylobacter causing all this? Again, we don't know because of the animals that were treated, they didn't, they still didn't respond, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people believe that, you know, if you have Campylobacter or Salmonella, even healthy dogs, you take 100 healthy dogs and you test them for Clostridium, or mm -hmm. um, salmonella, or any of these organisms, they still have the organisms, but they have no clinical signs. It's just when there's a shift or there's a dysbiosis that mm -hmm. these organisms become a major problem. Exactly. Thank you, doctor. So uh, one more question to go well, then we'll wrap up. Like, uh, like, the, like, vets want to understand like what can be a fluid therapy uh, like uh, regimen we should follow, like the choice of fluid to be used for diarrhea. <laughs> So um, the uh, again the can of worms because usually when we have um, a diarrhea uh, in here right it's not mm -hmm. it's not an out hospital treatment it's a continuous replacement therapy so we, the animal mm -hmm. is admitted or they go to a place where they are on fluids continuously right so like a twenty four hour facility for the most part right so our um, uh, so there is a, what we call is for example uh, you have you reset the volume and then there's a maintenance phase right so but if most of the cases back home at least at least when I left was that you an animal comes in for fluid therapy twice a day and then mm -hmm. goes back home, right? So there's a small difference in what you're trying to achieve, right? And so ideally what you're trying to achieve uh, is to make sure that the animal is not at least adequately hydrated, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, so the volume you give, right, is, is debatable because you give more volume when the animal isn't required, it's going to pee it out. You can see that any animal that gets an IV, uh, is going to pee before you leave the, uh, 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 the table, right? And so that can be challenging. But for most part, it's a balanced electrolyte solution. Like we used to use Ringer's lactate, or we used to use um, uh, we use Pla. That is uh, uh, what's what we use. It's a uh, plasma light, right? Uh, but it's usually a, a crystalloid, right? It's always a crystalloid unless uh, there are specific indications like protein losing entropy or something like that. But it's okay. usually uh, you have your uh, Ringer's lactate. You add some potassium in it. 20 mm -hmm. milligrams of potassium. You give it slowly so you don't affect the heart, but mm -hmm. that's usually what it is. Fair enough. So I think doctor, we're done with a lot of questions we had. Like, kind of like, uh, thank you for giving all this insight, uh, your practical uh, experience regarding all these things. <laughs> your kid is getting restless, why is not coming? <laughs> so uh, on that note, like, uh, did you say, like, would like to add something in this? Oh. Sorry. Yeah. No, nothing, uh, Prakash. Uh, everything went on well. I thank uh, Dr. Cyrus uh, for a very good uh, presentation. So uh, now we can I uh, thank Natural Remedies and uh, uh, all the delegates who have uh, from last uh, one and a half hour getting uh, uh, this yes. webinar. So. I'll hand over it to Ayush. Ayush, anything more you want to say? Just wanted to thank Dr. Cyrus for all his intellectual conversations, which he's added value to all of us, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So I'd like to like uh, thank you, Dr. Cyrus, uh, for joining us and understand more about like the topic you selected. And like I definitely like to say like these are the very valuable tips uh, on gut health management in both in dogs and cats in clinical practice. So uh, I believe like everybody have uh, like got answers for the questions they have asked. So anything if I missed or anything regarding the product what we have launched, uh, like we'll be very happy to reach out to you and like uh, you can like uh, still uh, do in the comment or the chat section.
like uh, i hope like all the participants enjoyed this and like this will be useful for the day to day practice i would like to thank nagesh reddy sir and like uh, kt parmeshwar sir for like uh, joining our here on the stage for uh, conducting this webinar also would like to thank mr ayush agarwal like uh, for making us this platform available to gain knowledge and to share knowledge with all the vets so anyone who have missed this uh, don't worry like uh, i have uh, said like this live sessions are been recorded and will be on regular basis so anything you want you can still access the links we are going to receive after the session is ended we'll be sharing this uh, video on like uh, youtube channel also and facebook channel of our uh, natural abilities so just uh, at the end like uh, i will like a big thank you for all the audience for being so interactive and making us like having a good experience with the topic thank you everyone for participating thank you dr cyrus thank you so much thank you sir thank, thank you, you. Yeah. thank you each and all thank you, thank you sir.